All right, Acts 26. So catch you up quickly, then we'll get into the text. As we know, the last several chapters, Paul, after ministering to the Gentiles, has finally, finally got to Jerusalem where he longed to be. He was warned before he went that trials would await him, and sure enough, it was absolutely true. He was beaten by the religious leaders. He was falsely accused. And every time he went through a trial and every false accusation that came against him, he used as an opportunity for the gospel. The last few weeks we saw him ministering to the crowd. Then we saw him ministering to the Sanhedrin. And then if you were here a couple weeks ago, we saw him speaking to Felix, right? And to uh, his, and then we saw uh, Herod. And now it, this last week, if you were here, he's been banished to Caesarea, as we know. He's been there for two years without any accusations. Can you imagine two years imprisoned when they don't even have any accusation against you? And that's what's happened to Paul. And then Paul, we're going to see this morning that through those two years, he did appeal to Caesar. And so to Caesar, he's going to go. But they don't have any accusation yet. And so Felix, who had, had imprisoned him during that time, was replaced by a man we saw last week by the name of Festus, who's taken over for him. And now we've seen there's a new governor over Festus, King Agrippa, and his wife Bernice, and they came, and with great pomp, as we saw last week, they were brought into the area. They're going to all question Paul. If you've ever been to Israel, this amphitheater is one of the most amazing uh, finds. It's still there, still in that same spot. I'm sure some of the stones have been replaced in 2,000 years, but it's in the exact same spot where Paul would have taught. And what had happened was he comes out in chains. He's been chained up, and he's been beaten, and more than likely by now, of course, all his bruises are gone, but he's still been chained up, and he's got a guard chained to him, every, and he's done nothing wrong, and so now he comes out in chains. First, the King Agrippa comes out in great, uh, you know, he's one of the Herods, comes out with great pomp, and everybody's, you know, wow, and they're all amazed by him, and they're the wealthy ones, and they're in positions of authority and power, and then the crowd comes out with them, and here we have you know, Fe Festus is there, and they all think they're about to put Paul on trial. But they're really the ones on trial, as we've been talking about. Amen? The Word of God is not on trial. That trial's already been settled. The Word of God is true. It's the world that's on trial. And so now we're going to come to after last week where they we're, you know, preparing and bringing everybody in. Now, Paul, as we said last week, he's standing there, no doubt probably in chains still, was at least brought out in chains. He's standing in front of this huge crowd, and now Paul's going to respond. So I titled the message this morning, if you have your outline, Almost Persuaded. Almost Persuaded. I can think of very few words in the Bible that are more tragic than almost persuaded. I almost went to heaven. I almost came to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Almost. Guys, Christianity is not something that we attain through our good works over time. At some point, there's a conscious decision to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, to recognize you're a sinner, and ask Jesus to end your life to be your Savior, to repent, to turn from the world and to the Lord, to surrender your life fully to Him. And guys, there's no almost about it. You're not kind of, there's nobody's kind of saved. Amen? Amen? My pastor in Lancaster used to say, it's like being kind of pregnant. <laughs> yeah, it can't happen. You either are or you're not. You're either born again or you're not. You're either a new creation in Christ or you're not. And it's so sad, almost. You almost persuade me with the gospel. So we're going to see some reactions to the word of God and to the gospel. And we're going to see a full, further fulfillment of Acts 9.15 that Paul would indeed suffer many things for the gospel, but also that he would be a witness before Gentiles and kings. Here's another king, another group of largely Gentile people that he's going to get to share the gospel to. And you know what? He had to suffer two years for this opportunity to take place, and Paul wasn't complaining one bit. And when, when we have an opportunity for the gospel, sometimes we have to go through trials for that opportunity to take place. But praise God, because it's always worth it. Amen? So if you have your outline, grab it. Let's go through it together. Again, I tell the message almost persuaded. And so we're going to see, first of all, we're going to see him sharing the gospel yet again. Every time Paul gets a chance, he doesn't talk politics. Amen? 
He doesn't talk about unfair treatment. He, doesn't, he just talks about Jesus every chance he gets. Amen? And he talks about what Jesus did in his life, how his life was transformed, who he is in Christ now, and he's not shy about it. Now, he's always gracious in the way he responds, as we're going to see in this morning's text. But once it's his opportunity to speak, he never is at a loss for words to say. And can I say that we as Christians should never be at a loss for words to say? And sometimes I know, well, it's kind of, I don't like to talk to people, right? We get that, you know, I'm so nervous. That's the hardest thing in the world to do. Don't people say the most scary thing in the world to do is public speaking? And people get petrified. But guys, is it hard to tell people about someone you love? Is it hard for me to introduce people to my wife? Is it hard for me to tell them about my children or my grandchildren? No, it's, it's not a have to, it's a get to, Amen. And guys, we ought to have that same heart when it comes to our Savior. So first we're going to see, sharing the truth of the gospel should be a joy and a privilege, not a burden. To see every opportunity as a privilege. And guys, I want to tell you, when you're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, when I share my faith, it never feels forced. It just doesn't. I'm just talking to people, and we start sharing our hearts, and they start asking about me. I go on sales calls, and I'm talking to my, my customers, and maybe it's a new client. And I want to tell you right now, every single sales call I go on all year long, Jesus comes up every single time. Because I pray for a divine appointment and an opportunity, and when you pray for that, God will bring it. And it's never something that I, you know, in the middle of a sentence talking about the economy, and by the way, do you know, that's not happened. It's just, we'll be talking, we'll be talking, and then we'll be sharing things, and there comes an opening, and the Holy Spirit just gives you an opportunity in a very natural way to start talking about your Savior. So guys, first thing I want us to see is that sharing the truth should be in a joy and a privilege, not a burden. If it's a burden for you, Can I encourage you, pray and ask God to give you a greater peace about sharing your faith, to take away whatever fear you may have, and you know what? Spend more time with the Lord, and you won't be able to help but talk about Him. Number two, we should all be prepared to share our testimony at a moment's notice. Again, it shouldn't be a terrifying moment, but the simple and sincere sharing of what the Lord has done for us. And we're going to see the elements of sharing our testimony. We've been talking about this for several weeks because Paul keeps sharing his testimony. And he shares it with this crowd, and then another crowd comes, and he shares it again. Another crowd comes, he shares it again. And we're going to talk about the elements of our testimony. First of all, who we were before we got saved. How many people in the room are sinners? We can talk about, that's me, amen? And you know what's the reality? Is a lot of times people think, people that don't know God and really haven't had much exposure to it, they just think that we all walk around a bunch of self-righteous people thinking we're perfect. Can we say amen to that? Do, a lot, do people think that a lot about church-going folks? And the reality is it takes them by surprise when you look at them and go, man, I was chief of sinners. You should have seen me before I met the Lord. You know, man, my life was a mess. I made such horrible choices. Here's some of the stuff I've been through. You know what that does? It helps them understand that we're just like them apart from Jesus Christ. Amen. That we were once lost, and now we've been found. And it's not because we're good, but because he's gracious. Amen? Amen? So we're going to see that element. Secondly, not only who we were before we got saved, but how did you come to know the Lord? How did you come to know the Lord? How How were you introduced to Jesus? Maybe some of you were invited to a Billy Graham crusade or a Harvest crusade. Maybe somebody was invited to church. I know a few people in this room walked by and heard music, came in and got saved. Amen? Maybe somebody invited you to church. Praise God for those five percenters. Amen? (laughs) Invited you to church. And the reality is that somebody loved you enough to reach out to you in love. Maybe you went through a disastrous situation where you came to the end of yourself and you became desperate for God. Maybe you reached out to somebody. But the reality is we all have, here's who I was, here's how I met Jesus. And then the third element It's who are we now in Christ? How has my life changed since I came to know Jesus? By the way, if you came to know Jesus and your life didn't change, I don't know what Jesus you met. Amen? Maybe the Mormon Jesus or something. Maybe the Jesus of the the fault. When Jesus comes into your life, everything changes. Amen? 
I'm a new creation. I'm dead to the person I used to be. My priorities change. I don't become perfect, but my priorities change. My passions change. My desires change. And my view of sin changes. Can we say amen to that? You still love your sin, and now you hate it. Right? You used to run to sin, and now you're heartbroken by it. So point number two, we should all be prepared to share our testimony in moments notice. And then finally, we're going to see some responses to the truth of the gospel. And we're going to see that at least in this case, recorded in the text, nobody responds favorably. Nobody. Almost persuaded. Oh, I'll think about it for another time. Festus even says to Paul, you've lost your mind. So when you share your faith, some people are going to tell you you've lost your mind. Amen? That's okay. Don't be surprised, because that's what the world does. So let's begin there in verse 1 of Acts 26, almost persuaded. Sharing the truth of the gospel should be a joy and a privilege, not a burden. Look at verse 1 of Acts 26. So they brought Paul in. They're mainly looking for evidence for a charge that they can write on a piece of paper and send with Paul as he goes to Caesar. He said it would be written, the last verse of the previous chapter says, for it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner not specifying the charges against him. So they're going to examine Paul's life to find something to accuse him of so they can send him to Caesar so they think that Paul's on trial, but they're the ones on trial. Look at verse one. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Now, King Agrippa, we talked about this. He enters the auditorium with his sister slash girlfriend. There's a lot of problems with that that's sentence. Amen? They've both been married multiple times. Now she's hanging out with him, and she's just trying to latch onto somebody who politically helped her rise in the ranks. There's nothing new under the sun. Amen? A man of position, a man of great wealth, a man who sought the praise and glory of men by flaunting his wealth and position. And then he gives Paul permission to speak. I love that Paul, even though he is God's chosen man, even though he is filled with the Holy Spirit, even though he's one of the 12 apostles, even though his background is that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, he was still a man that submitted even to ungodly authority in these circumstances. Now, if they had forbidden him to speak, we might have got a different response. But Paul waited until he was given permission. And I think there's a good thing for us to learn. If we're going to share our faith with people, it's good to earn that opportunity in a way. And I'm not saying you, you should keep your faith to yourself otherwise. But I'm just saying that, you know, if you earn an opportunity and you're sharing your faith with somebody, it's a real natural conversation. Somebody will even ask you, Often. I have people ask me all the time just because of the way we interact on a sales call or out by the mailbox or whatever it might be. Well, oh, you're a pastor. Tell me how that, how did you become a pastor? Was that an opportunity for the gospel or what? Well, Paul waits until Agrippa says to him, okay, it's out there in his chains. There's a big crowd in front of him. All right, Paul, go ahead. Your turn to speak. He just gave a microphone to an apostle. Here it comes. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. So he gives Paul permission to speak, but he's really not looking for truth. He's looking to put Paul on trial. And a lot of times people want to put us on trial for our faith, not really looking for truth, and they're going to get truth anyway. Amen? And when Paul motions with his hand, in those days it speaks from a worldly perspective, it was his way of showing honor to the man in authority. Paul was as bold as they came, but he was patient to speak. He taught people with respect when, when that was an option, it was a, there was ability to do so. He, he honors him by reaching out with his hand and acknowledging his position. So the enthroned king, from the world's perspective, putting an enslaved, enslaved prisoner on trial, that's the world's perspective. The enthroned king putting a prisoner on trial. But from a spiritual perspective, it was an enslaved king on trial before God and testimony given by an enthroned slave. From the world's perspective, it was an enthroned king and a slave, but it was really an enthroned slave and enslaved king. Amen? He was a slave to sin and death. 
People in this world, they can have position, they can have money, they can have power, they can have authority. And if they don't have Jesus, ultimately, they don't have anything. Because without the Lord, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Amen. What would a man give in exchange for eternity? So Paul, as a salute and respect toward Agrippa, he had a wonderful ability to respect authority even when he was being treated unfairly. Paul gets to speak, and he's been enslaved for two years without a crime. Now, if you've been enslaved for two years without a crime, and you had a crowd in front of you, and they gave you a mic, what might you say? So what's up with putting me in jail for two years? I didn't do anything. Where's the ACL? Get me an attorney out here now. I'm suing all you people. And that would have been, you know, dude, I'm in, what did I do? You don't even have a judgment against me. You've breaking the law, you bunch of lawbreakers. Paul doesn't do that. Paul says, crowd, let me give them Jesus. Amen? It's an opportunity for the gospel. He sees every opportunity to share it as a privilege, not a burden. Verse 2. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews. Paul's joy came through opportunities to preach the gospel. He says, I count myself happy. Two years enslaved when I did nothing wrong. Happy. Beaten by the high priest in Jerusalem for doing nothing wrong. Happy. Beaten to death in the city square. Happy. Why? Here's a man with an eternal perspective. Here's a man whose focus is only on seeing people come to know Christ. He's not worried about his comfort. He's not worried about how he's treated. He's not worried about how the world looks at him. He has one passion, and that's to preach Jesus Christ, him crucified and risen from the dead. Amen? I guarantee if you'd gone to Paul and said, Paul, you're going to be falsely accused, beaten numerous times, and you're going to be enslaved, and you're going to be put in house arrest for two years, but at the end, you're going to get to tell the whole crowd about Jesus. He'd sign up so fast you wouldn't know what happened. And too often, we play the victim, and, we, and may we not be, become like the world. Do we have a world full of victims right now? Nobody's at fault for doing anything. Everything you did, it's not my fault. I didn't do it. It was my great-grandparents had this problem, and so it's just... It's not me, and don't blame me, and I shouldn't be accountable for anything. And you know what? There's a victim mentality. Guys, instead of being victims, look for opportunities to use the trials of life to share the gospel and the truth of a risen and living Savior. So Paul did not moan and complain about being held so long without charges. And this is the response of a spiritually mature man in the midst of a trial. Instead, he rejoiced over the opportunity that was in front of him. He saw this trial as an opportunity for the gospel. He saw it as a joy and not a burden. Verse 3. Especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. Remember, King Agrippa is related to the Herods. He's half Jewish, at least half Jewish. So because of his Jewish background and upraising, he would have an understanding of Jewish the word and the Jewish traditions and the Jewish feasts and the Jewish law. And so I love Paul's heart, even though he's directly addressing the king, he's really speaking to the whole crowd. And in addressing the king, he says to him, well, I know that you have this background, so I know you're going to hear me out. Again, when sharing your faith with someone, it's good to find common ground. To begin on a place where you're speaking to each other with respect. You don't water down the message to make them feel good about it, but you preach it with boldness. But look for an opportunity. When I have people come knock on my doors with little name tags, or when I get in a conversation on Facebook with somebody that's attacking our faith, I will always try to, they knock on the door. You guys are going door to door because you believe there's a God. They'll say, yes, me too. We got that in common. You know what? You're taking time out of your Saturday to go door to door to talk to people about the God you believe in. I'm upstairs right now studying my Bible so I can preach tomorrow about the God I believe in. We've got a lot in common, but that's kind of where it stops. So let me just talk, tell me about your God and explain to me how you're going to get to heaven. And I let them explain. And I'll listen. 
Then I'll say, can I tell you how I believe we get to heaven? Do you think I'm going to get a better audience than if I go, you're a bunch of cult-worshipping weirdos and get off my front porch? <laughs> Amen? Does Jesus love those people on your front porch? Did he die for them? Shouldn't we love them too? We don't love them enough to, to agree. We don't love them enough to water down the gospel. But let's learn an opportunity. So here's Paul, the boldest man who ever lived, keeping quiet till he gets asked. And then, oh, Herod. Well, you're familiar with this. Finding common ground. And he's now going to, again, share the truth of the gospel, seeing it not as a burden, but as a privilege. Paul was really happy to talk to King Agrippa. I know you understand our culture, you know, understand our traditions, you understand our religion. Paul's real focus is not his own defense, but reaching a grip. He was not worried if they, if they were going to put him back in prison. He wasn't worried if they were going to take him out and kill him. He wasn't worried about any of that right now. He's like, I got one focus right now. It's to get the gospel to people that need to hear it. He let Grippa know in advance that his speech was not going to be short. You hear what he says there? Look what he says. I beg you to hear me patiently. I've been waiting two years for this message, and I'm not cutting it short for brunch. Amen? <laughs> I'm not dialing it down because there's a football game on. I'm, not, I, I'm here. I've got the crowd in front of me. I've been praying for this moment. I've been asking that the Holy Spirit would fill me with fire and power, and I'm going to share it. And thank you in advance for being patient with the message that's coming right now. So point number one, almost persuaded. Sharing the truth of the gospel should be a joy and a privilege, not a burden. Paul isn't, isn't angry. He isn't bitter. He doesn't feel burdened. He waits for days like this. He prays for days like this. He's so excited for the privilege and the opportunity. He even thinks the crowd that's going to listen to him. He thinks the kings. He thinks those who falsely accused him. He's like, look, I just want an opportunity to share the hope that lies within me. Lord, give us that same heart. Amen? Point number two, we should all be prepared to share our testimony at a moment's notice. I had the guys out at the prison do this, and I actually collected their papers, and I said, I want to challenge you guys to go home this week, go back to your bunks, and, and out while you're out fighting fires and stuff, and I want you to write out your testimony. I explained to them how to do it, and they did it. And I want to encourage you to do the same. If you don't know what your testimony is, Let's look at the example of Paul's testimony, the elements that are there. And I want to encourage you just to write it out. By the way, every time I write down my testimony, guess what? I'm encouraged. Amen? I'm reminded of all that the Lord has done for me. I'm reminded of his love, his grace, and his mercy. And it makes me just praise him and thank him all the more. So Paul is ready to share his testimony at a moment's notice. He's looking for opportunities to do so. And again, he's not standing in front of a crowd that's going to be friendly. You've got the people that came up from Jerusalem that want him dead. You've got a king that's there that just likes his power and authority. You've got Festus, who we're going to see is going to think he's lost his mind. Doesn't slow Paul down. Does it with respect and preaches with power. Let's begin there in verse 4. As Paul's now going to share his message, and he's going to begin with who he was before he was saved. Look at verse 4 and 5. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. Is he speaking to some of the crowd right there? Some of that crowd has come up there just wanting him dead. And they're looking for an accusation. And he says, from the beginning, I was a man. I was a religious man. I was a godly man. I pursued God. And every Jewish man here knows it. This is who I am. This was my life. This was my passion. Verse 5. They knew me from the first. If they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. So his past was that he was a very religious man. A Pharisee in Hebrew, it means a separatist. I was separated from the world and unto God. It's a good thing. And I was so focused on the things of God and I was passionate for the things of God. 
And I was a man who cared about nothing else but being obedient to my passion for the things of God. And he was very zealous. He was very religious. One of 6,000 religious zealots who adhered to strict, strict Jewish orthodoxy. The most orthodox of all the Jews. Radicals. Customs had to be exact. We see parts of scripture when it, when it came to tithe, they'd get all their, they'd get going, you know, can you imagine? They would go in and get all their spice rack down. And they would take out, you know, their, their mint. Okay, nine mints for God, nine for me, one for God. And they would go, okay, get the cumin out. Now they're going to go through. And so when they tithe, they were like down to the nth degree. They wanted to make sure they obeyed all of the laws. Because in their heart and in their mind, that's how you're saved. Keep the law. Be faithful before God. And they loved also, most of the Pharisees loved that when they kept the law, it somehow made them better than the people who didn't. And they would walk around with their robes and they loved to be in the middle of the street when it was prayer time. And they loved the praise of men and they loved the seats up in the front of the synagogue. And they just loved to be admired by men and just be seen as godly by the world. Guys, I don't care about being seen godly by the world. I want to be seen as faithful by God. Amen. And so here that he is. I was one of those guys. I'm a black robe dude. I'm, the, I'm a Pharisee. I'm one of the most religious people on the planet. Ask the Jews here. They know. I'm not some uneducated Yahoo. I'm not some guy that doesn't know what Judaism teaches. I was as devout a Jewish believer as there are on the planet. No one had greater credentials, Jewish credentials, than Paul. He was truly a Pharisee of Pharisees. And again, as we'll see, being religious is not the answer. He was religious and lost. Now, the Old Covenant, was that God's way at one point? What's the answer? For thousands of years. Amen? But what, was all, what were all the feasts and all the rituals and and every sacrifice, what was it all pointing to? Jesus. All of it pointing to Jesus. Every bit of it pointing to Jesus. So here's where there's a major problem. Jesus came, and those who were doing the rituals and having the sacrifices and all the things that God had commanded in obedience to God were going to be fulfilled and were fulfilled in Christ. What did he say on the cross? To Talisti, which means it is what? Finished. Paid in full. Now the problem is, with these religious leaders, is they reject Jesus as the Messiah because they were looking for a conquering Messiah, not a suffering Savior. And because of that, they're still hanging on to the old tradition. And as soon as you hold on to that which points to Christ, instead of to Christ, who has fulfilled it, you have now have a false faith. Guys, you cannot have the Father apart from the Son. You cannot come to the Father through your good works. Because guess what? At that point, Judaism becomes like any other works-based salvation. I'm trying to earn it. I'm being good. I'm keeping the law. I have 252 laws I must keep. It's very difficult. No, it's not difficult. It's impossible. And Jesus came and paid the price on the cross. Amen? So he's very zealous for what is true, pointing to Christ, but as soon as you continue to hold on to that and reject Christ, it now becomes false. Does that make sense? Because it is true, pointing to the Lord, but when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was torn. Amen? And we can all enter into the Holy of Holies. And there's no more lambs being dragged in on the Sabbath. And no more blood being shed. No more sacrifice. Because the blood of bulls and goats cannot redeem the sinfulness of man. Amen? Amen. Only Jesus can. So now he's very religious, but he's lost. He's zealous for half a truth, but half a truth is a whole lie. Amen? He's lost. So here I am. I'm a zealous man. I'm as religious as they come. Guess what? Religion won't save you. Now again, the word religion today has really become a bad word in a lot of cases, and in some ways it's earned. 
Because religion, the word relingara, you've heard me say this many times in Latin, it means to relink. It's relinking sinful man back to holy God. So I love what that means. But what does it come to mean to the world? It's like man's attempt to get to God by doing good stuff. Amen? I'm religious. Oh, I keep a bunch of rules and I do all this stuff and I make sure I go to mass and I go to this and I do this and I keep these things and I go here and I do this and I keep the rituals and I, I'm doing all the stuff I've got to do and, and, that, and that's going to get me into heaven, hopefully. And that's the attitude that most people have. All the Jews are looking forward to the hope of the Messiah. And what Paul's about to tell them is, I'm being accused of believing that he already came. Look at verse 6 and 7. I now stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise are 12 tribes earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I'm being accused by the Jews. The hope of the promise. What hope of the promise is he talking about? The Messiah. Why am I on trial? We've been waiting for 2,000 years for the Messiah to come. Could have said at that point, we know he's going to be born in Bethlehem because it tells us in the word. We know that he's going to be born of a virgin because it tells us in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. We know that in Isaiah 53, he will, like a lamb led to slaughter, open not his mouth. We know that he will suffer crucifixion, predicted 700 years before crucifixion took place. We know that all these things, and all these fulfillments, and it's all fulfilled in Christ. And he said, I am being judged because the thing they've been hoping for, that our fathers hoped for, that every one of us of this faith have hoped for, came. That's what I'm on trial for, because I know it's Jesus, and they reject him. So that's what he's saying to this crowd. Now, we don't have the we don't have the, you know, what are they doing in the crowd? You think it might be some moaning every once in a while? Think the Jews up there, I, the hope of the promise, oh. oh, oh. <laughs> See people getting necks popping out, veins popping out of necks. People getting angry. And Paul, in truth, the truth in love, he stayed true to the, what the Old Testament pointed to. He's holding fast to the word of God. We're going to see in a moment, he, he follows the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? They say, we're of Abraham. Uh-uh. I'm following the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know when Jesus died on the cross, it says he went and set the captives free. He went into Abraham's bosom, and all the Old Testament saints got ushered into heaven by Jesus. Guess what? That's who I'm following. They're still hanging on till the Old Covenant. They're still waiting for the Messiah. They've missed him. Accusations and attacks come against those who would dare to stand for the truth of God's word. I pastored a church in Santa Cruz for 10 years, as most of you know. And I've never met a city that just does whatever the heck it wants and does it in the name of God. Everything's fine. Everything's good. The culture's good. The Bible's wrong. We need to fix it. If you look in, and I love when they will say to you, well, if you looked in the original language. Oh... I know they don't even read the Bible. And they read something on an internet website. And half the time, these guys are pastors telling you this. It's tragic. And the sad part is that people are making excuses for the word of God. There, there are people that are attacking Billy Graham because he stood up for marriage. How dare he? Stood up for the truth of God's word. There's people saying he's burning. There was a gal from Vogue said he's burning in hell. I, I don't think so. And your opinion doesn't matter. And we need to stand up for the word of God when nobody else will. Amen? That's what Paul's doing. The Old Testament's true. All pointed to Jesus. He came. I'm on trial because I know the truth. That's a, that's a bold statement. And he's saying it without reservation. You know the Bible says that God elevates his word above his name? Do you know that it says that? How, how much reverence did they have for his name? Do you know when they would write his name, when they were transcribing the scriptures, they would write a letter of his name and stop and go take, cleanse all their clothes, put on new fresh clothes, cleanse themselves, go back and write another letter, and then go back and cleanse themselves again? And they would leave the vowels out because they didn't feel worthy to write out God's entire name? So how much did they elevate his name? 
But the Bible says he elevates his word above his name. Why is that? Because people can use the name of God and make it define it any way they want to if they don't have the word of God to, be, to stand behind it. Amen? So he elevates his word above his name. Guys, we need to, when people make, say, make false statements about the word of God, in my mind, it's equivalent to cursing God. Because he elevates his word above his name. Amen? Guys, got to take the word seriously. Verse 8. So he tells them, for this sake, King Agrippa, I'm, I'm accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? This is a great question. Why, is it, why would it be incredible to you to think that God raises the dead? God said, light is. Bang! Light. Amen? Galaxies upon galaxies. You can look into the stars as far as you can see, millions of light years away, but he put the light there before the light. I mean, the, people say, well, that's why the, we have an old uh, universe because it takes millions of years for light to get here. He put the light there before he put the stars there. Read the Bible. So he says light is and light was. He holds the universe in his hands, but then you can go down and get a microscope and look at, you know, atoms in a microscope, and he holds all those together. He holds the universe together. He holds the smallest things together, the greatest things together in the palm of his hand. Is it a problem for him to raise the dead? Did he not create all life? Can't, did he breathe into Adam and create life? What's the answer? So here's the reality, guys. By the way, if he can raise people from the dead, can he take care of your problems at work? Can he help you with your marriage? Can he help you with your finances? Can he help you with your illness? Is our God greater than everything? What's the answer? And guys, our God is greater than you think. Amen? No matter how great you think he is, he's way greater than that. No matter how powerful you think he is, he's more powerful than that. No matter how holy you think he is, he's more holy than that. Guys, when we get to heaven, we are going to be blown away. Amen? But here we are on earth and we limit God to our ability to understand. I'm glad God's not confined in greatness to my ability to understand how great he is. Can we say amen to that? Because I'm, I'm pretty much an idiot. Amen? Compared to God, I'm definitely an idiot. Amen? And so here's the reality is, he says to him, like, why is it so hard for you to believe that God raises the dead? Why is that, a, why is that an issue? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you believe that, you won't have a problem with the rest of the Bible. Amen? Amen. Starts there. Why is it so hard for you to believe? Paul found it inconceivable that he should be condemned for believing in the resurrection, the great hope of the Jews. Paul attempted to convert Agrippa and the entire crowd at the same time when he says you, he says, the word there is in the plural. So it's not just Agrippa that he's saying to him, it should be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead. The word you there is plural. He's looking around, he may be glancing at Agrippa, but why is it incredible to you? that God raises the dead. Why is it so hard for all of you to believe that? Guys, I love the, the boldness that comes when you are someone who's in love with the Lord and you spend time in his presence. Too many struggle with God and his ability to do the miraculous because their concept of God is far too small. Can I encourage you? God's greater than you think. Don't lose sight of that. Amen? I love every time they find a new galaxy. Oh, we found another galaxy. Found it. We're, it's actually this much bigger than it used to be. That just means God's hand is that much greater because it all fits in the palm. Amen? He holds it all together. I love when they, f by the way, God already knew it was there. You might have just found it, but he already knew. Amen? Difficulty measured by the capacity of the one doing the work. When God is doing the work, any talk of difficulty is just ridiculous. There's nothing too difficult for God. Amen? We won't pray because we think it's too difficult. Guys, the resurrection is key. Why don't you believe in the resurrection, he says. Guys, if we don't believe in the resurrection, throw horns on the wall, call it the Elks Club, and let's just have, you know, a potluck. Amen? 
If there's no resurrection, there's no Christianity. Do you understand that? And there are yet, Christ, quote, Christian churches today that say the resurrection's not true. That makes you uh, not a Christian church. Amen? <laughs> Preach the resurrection. He preaches it with boldness. Without the resurrection, there's no hope, there's no heaven, there's no salvation. It's essential for the Christian faith. And by the way, that's what makes Christianity unique, because everybody else serves a dead prophet or a dead God, and we serve a risen and living Savior who has triumphed over sin and death. Amen? Shouldn't be ashamed of it. I love Paul's heart. I love his passion. Let's not limit God. And what it says there in verse 9, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now he's telling them about who he was before. So I'm a real religious guy, and by the way, I was once like everybody here. I didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Matter of fact, I used to do things contrary to what he taught. Verse 10. This also I did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put, when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Paul says, look, before I came to know Christ, I was just like the people here. Matter of fact, I was the chief of persecutors of Christianity. I was Osama bin Laden. I was chasing Christians down. I was attacking them. I was dragging them out of synagogues. I was forcing them to blaspheme and curse the name of Jesus Christ. When they voted to put people to death, I raised my hand. When Stephen was stoned to death, he held the coats. He said, look, I was an enemy of Christ. That's who I was. Here's his testimony of who he was before he came to know the Lord. By the way, does that not ring true with the hearts of some of the people in this crowd? They're still those people. And he's letting them know, I was just like you. I was just like you. I used to be someone who attacked believers in Jesus Christ. Paul walking in spiritual darkness before he was saved. He was zealous for religion. He had missed the Messiah. He was religious but lost. So Paul's letting them know, I was an enemy of Christ. This is my background. But now he's going to tell them what happened. No doubt sitting there, you were an enemy of Christ, you attacked Christians. Some of them would even be mumbling. Well, yeah, I remember. He was voting with us. You remember we were putting the Christians to death? He used to raise his hand with us. What happened to him? And now he's going to tell everybody what happened to him. Because, guys, if you leave it right there, that's not the gospel. That's not, here's who I was, okay? And a lot of people do that. They'll tell you how horrible they were. But, guys, we've got to move on to what did Jesus do to change my life? Amen? What happened in my life? Verse 12, point number two of sharing gospel. How, do we, how we came to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Look at verse 12. While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. The first thing that happened as Paul walked in darkness is he saw a light. Amen. Who's the light of the world? And us, too. We're the light of the world. But Jesus is the light of the world. And this man's walking in darkness. He's so controlled by his hatred. He's so controlled by his, his uh, you know, legalistic thought of how to earn heaven. He's zealous for a lie. And he's attacking the true believers of Christ. And what does the Lord do? He turns the light on and opens Paul's eyes to the truth. But not only did he see a light, that's not enough. A lot of people in cults think they saw a light. Amen? I used to witness people in downtown Santa Cruz. Yeah, Pastor, I saw a light, man. And I, I said, you want, were you on LSD at the time? A lot of lights in LSD, my brother. That ain't Jesus. Amen? It's, just not, it's not good enough to see a light. Somebody was driving behind you with his halogens on, bro. You saw a light. It's got to go beyond that. Paul saw a light, but it was followed by the word. Amen? Look what it says in verse 14. And when all had fallen to the ground, when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me, saying in Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. 
We talked about this repeatedly, but he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who is he persecuting? Christians. And in so doing, he's persecuting Jesus. So when you persecute God's, when you persecute Jesus' family, they're persecuting him. So when someone persecutes you for your faith, they're persecuting our Savior. Amen? And if God is for us, who can be against us? And here, he says it's hard for you to kick against the goads when you're leading animals that have a sharp stick with a point on the end. And when they would try to move them, a lot of times the animals would kick back against the one trying to lead them. So they'd put the goads there, and every time they'd kick, it would cut them open. And eventually they'd realize, kicking that stick's a bad idea. I'm going to stop kicking. And he said, why are you kicking against the goads? Why are you fighting against my leading in your life? Why are you fighting against Almighty God? Why are you fighting against the truth? And then Paul says there in verse 15, so I said to him, who are you, Lord? Don't you love that he doesn't know who he, know, who he is yet, but he knows he's Lord? Amen. Amen? The power of God knocking him down to the ground, a light shining, and a voice from heaven was, who are you, Lord? Because whoever you are, you're the guy paraphrasing amen i know you're the one now remember the crowd's listening who are you lord and then he says i am jesus whom you are persecuting again we don't hear but i have an idea some of the people in the crowd got a little fired up right about there i am jesus he doesn't water down the truth he doesn't give them a different name. He doesn't make it a message that's easier for people to palate. He speaks the truth with great boldness. Amen? Guys, there's no other name under heaven by which one must be saved. Amen? Amen. It's only the name of Jesus. That's why I don't talk about God a lot. I use that term. I, I like to say Jesus. Because God can be, you know, some people, my God's a doorknob. My God's a statue in my backyard. My God's the universe. My God, that, I don't like that. So, I, Jesus. Amen? Let's narrow it down for you. It's Jesus. That's what Paul says. The truth had dawned on Paul. Jesus had risen from the dead. Jesus had ascended back to heaven. And Paul had been persecuting the very Messiah of Israel, the very Son of God. He says there, here's what Jesus said to Paul, but rise and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I have yet to reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you, to open their eyes in order to turn from their darkness to the light, from the power of Satan to God. Ooh, oh, do you think some of the religious people might have popped a cap right about there? I'm going to send you to the Jews and the Gentiles so you can turn them from the power of Satan to God. He's saying we're from Satan. And you just, oh, people are getting... And Paul keeps preaching it. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen? God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. He said Satan. I know churches that won't talk about hell or Satan or sin. Well, that's going to scare people. If hell scares you, you need to be scared. I'm not scared of hell because I'm not going. <laughs> I'm not going. I'll never see it. I'm not going. Thank you, Jesus. Got nothing to do with me and everything to do with him. Amen? You know, it's been said the gospel can literally scare the hell out of you. <laughs> Amen? I ain't worried about it. It's been out of me. Not sweating it. Going to heaven. And then he says there that you may receive forgiveness of sins, an inheritance among those who've been sanctified by faith in me. Guys, sanctification, being set apart unto God, only comes by faith in Jesus Christ and no other way. Amen? Not good works, not being religious, not even, look, not just reading your Bible, praying a lot, uh, being real involved, having a servant's heart, all those can be our wonderful things, but they won't save you. Apart from faith in Christ, you cannot be saved. Amen? This is a pretty... Now he's telling what happened to him and what the Lord said to him, but as he's saying what the Lord said to him, he's also telling everyone else. 
Amen? Eyes are being opened to the truth of who Jesus is. So the first thing he does is he tells them who he was before he got saved. Then he tells them how he came to know the Lord. I'm running a little bit. Uh, I'm going to move, move the things up here a little quicker. I'm running out of time. Verse 19. Who we are in Christ. Now therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting of repentance. That is the gospel. Amen? Amen? I'm not going to be disobedient to what God told me to do, King Agrippa. By the way, you're the king, but he's the king of kings. Amen? I don't listen to men, I honor God. And he's challenging, and he's speaking the truth with boldness to do work. And notice it says there that obedient to God's calling... Acts 9, 6, in Paul's conversion, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he meant it in sincerity. Paul obeyed immediately. He was led by the hand into Damascus. And, 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 and Ananias restored his sight and baptized him. And Paul was used mightily by God because he simply responded by faith in obedience to God's command. Yes, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'll do it. And when's the last time you asked God that question? Lord, what do you want me to do? I'll do it. Lord, whatever the question is, the answer is yes. I'm in. Lord, use me. For your glory. Do you know he'll answer that prayer every single time? And here's the fruit of salvation. Again, is proclaiming the gospel to the lost. When you've truly been born again, we realize that our salvation is the greatest gift and we want others to have it. How many of you guys heard Kathy Lee Gifford this week? God bless her. Amen? I know people don't like her. I, she's one of my favorite people now. Amen? And they asked her about Billy Graham, and she just started, she preached it. And they said at one point, why are you so bold with your faith, Kathy Lee? And this is the same analogy I always use. I, I really loved it. She said, well, if everybody had cancer and I had the cure, wouldn't I be the most selfish person on the planet if I kept it to myself? And guess what? There's a cancer of sin that everybody has, and the cure is Jesus Christ, Him crucified and risen from the dead on ABC. Praise God. Amen? Amen. Guys, that's the answer. You don't keep it to yourself, you don't hide it from the world. That's part of the testimony, is proclaiming the truth with boldness, being obedient to God's calling. Paul preached repentance, turning away from sin. The Jews who thought they had no need for repentance thought their heritage, well, I'm Jewish, so I'm going to heaven. I'm good. No, I don't care. if you're. I, well, my grandparents were missionaries to, you know, wherever, and so I'm, I, you know, I got, I'm in good with God because I have missionaries. In my, God has no grandchildren. Amen. Amen? You're not saved because someone else served God. Choose today whom you're going to serve. Let's finish up. For these reasons, verse 21, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God to this day, I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things that those which the prophets and Moses said would come. Again, I just imagine the Jewish section up there up the top. You know, so he said Jesus. Now he says he's doing the things that Moses said he was going to do. And he just can see, ah, right, the anger. And Paul with authority and love and grace and power is preaching the truth that Christ would suffer, verse 23, that he would be the first to raise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Paul testifies that his persecution was a result of his obedience to do what God had called him to do. Don't be surprised when you obey God that the world mocks you. Noah obeyed and built a boat for 120 years and got mocked for 120 years. Daniel obeyed, got thrown in the lion's den. John the Baptist obeyed and he was beheaded. Jesus obeyed and went to the cross. Paul is, Paul is obeying God and the Jews are seeking to kill him. Guys, for obeying God, some people aren't going to like it. Amen? So don't be surprised. But he's had help from God. Why is Paul still standing here? Why isn't he dead? Why isn't Paul dead already? Because God's not finished with him. Thank you, Jeff. We're indestructible until God's through with us. Amen? Amen? Do you know we're not going to heaven one second before God says it's okay? Amen? 
and the world can't do anything unless God allows. So he's, I'm standing here because God is for me. And the central elements of Paul's preaching was the suffering of the Savior and his resurrection from the dead. I love that picture. So how are they going to respond? Last few minutes here. How do they respond? Is this a pretty clear message of the gospel? He says there in that last verse, to deliver it to both the Jews and the Gentiles. Is he not doing that right now? Doesn't he have an amphitheater filled with people? They're all hearing the gospel. They've all heard it's Jesus in no other way. They all heard that he rose from the dead. He's the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecy. I'm only here and standing here alive because God's got his hand on me. And I'm being faithful to what he's commanded me to do. How are they going to respond? This is sad. Verse 24. First, we're going to look at Festus. Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Basically, Paul, you've lost your mind. Paul, you're outside of your mind. You believe that some guy rose from the dead? Do you really believe that? Do you know if everyone else doesn't believe, it's still the truth? Amen? Do you know the truth is not something we vote on, even though the world thinks we do now? Uh, we voted. We have a new truth about marriage now because we voted. You can say two plus two is five and vote on it and pass it. It's still four. And the truth is still the truth even if you vote on it. Amen? And you create a new truth. There's no new truth. Jesus is the truth. So he says, you've lost your mind. You're beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. You just learned so much, you're, you've lost your mind. You don't know what you're talking about. But he said, look what he says, I am not mad, most noble Festus. He calls him noble Festus. He just told him he was crazy, that he lost his mind. He says, I'm not mad, most noble Festus. Most noble, magnanimous position of authority. But I speak the words of truth and reason. Don't you love that Paul responds even to accusations and anger with truth and does it in love amen just remember the person yelling in the argument is usually the one that's wrong at the loudest volume amen and the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of god we don't have to yell and scream to speak the truth with boldness amen so that's what he's doing not backing down you know do you know that in heaven we know this from Luke 16, the people in hell have a memory of earth. Do you think Festus is kind of remembering this conversation? Assuming he never got saved, which there's no evidence that he did. Amen? Calling him mad? You know what, actually, he was pretty smart. Boy, he heard from the Lord. He was right. Well, that's Festus. How about King Agrippa? Look what Agrippa says. For the king, verse 26, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this has been done in a, this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, you're part Jewish, you know our faith, and by the way, Jesus dying on the cross and raising from the dead wasn't done undercover. Everybody knew it, amen? Remember on the road to Damascus, the two apostles, the two believers, disciples are walking along the road, Jesus comes alongside, he veils his, and he says, what are you guys talking about? He's like, dude, what, are you new to town? There's no, only one subject, it's Jesus. Remember when Jesus died on the cross that the world went pitch black for three hours? That the earth quaked and dead people got up and went into the city and preached Jesus? That's kind of a big deal. Grandma shows up at your house. Hey guys, I've missed you, by the way, Jesus is God. Amen? That's what happened. So Agrippa, this isn't news to you. I'm not making stuff up. You were there. You saw it. You know it's true, Agrippa. You know it's true. Verse 27. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. He's giving him credit. I know you believe. King Agrippa, you believe the prophets. You've studied the old covenant. You know the truth. You know it pointed to the Messiah. You were there when it happened with Jesus. You know that he went to the cross. You know it's been reported he rose from the dead. Because he did. King Agrippa. So now who's on trial? Paul on trial here? King Agrippa, look at verse 27. Then Agrippa said, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. There's the title of the message, almost persuaded. Is almost not the saddest 
word in this whole chapter. Amen? You almost persuade me. Can you imagine? If, and again, we don't know from the but if Agrippa's in hell right now, do you think almost might be ringing in his ears? Almost persuaded? Almost? I was told as a kid, almost only counts in horseshoes, hand grenades, and a bombs. Amen? It doesn't count in, in faith. Amen? Amen? You can't almost be persuaded. You can't almost be a Christian. You either know him or you don't. It wasn't done in a corner. The truth wasn't hidden from them. Last few verses. Verse 29, Paul said, I would be to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. Paul says, you're almost persuaded. My prayer is that everybody here, all of you, he's looking up, will not be almost but altogether persuaded just as I am that Jesus Christ is God. I want you to have everything I have except these chains I've got right here. That's what he's saying. Last two verses. And when they had gone aside, when they had said these things, the king stood up as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. When they had gone aside, they talked among themselves saying, this man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Here's the problem. They're going to make no decision on Paul. We're only more, we're only more importantly, no decision on Christ. They're going to be like Pontius Pilate. What did he do? Washed his hands. I'm out. I'm not, I'm out. And that's what people do. They'll make no decision on Christ. Guys, no decision is a decision. Amen? If you don't have a decision for him, you've made a decision against him. Amen? Is this good stuff right here or what? Does the Bible rock? Amen? You know what? We've got family members that might be almost persuaded. Don't keep it to yourself. You've got coworkers almost persuaded. Don't keep it to yourself. Amen? May we love people enough to have a conversation that will be uncomfortable for them to hear. Can we say amen to that? What kind of doctor would you have if you went into the doctor and he did x-rays and found out that you had cancer in your body and you needed surgery and you needed chemo? But he called, came in and said, well, that'll hurt their feelings, so I just won't tell them. And I'll send them home to die. Amen? He'd be sued. Amen? He'd be in jail. But you know what? As Christians, we meet people all the time with spiritual cancer head to toe, and we have the antidote. It's Jesus Christ. How can we keep it to ourselves? Amen? So almost persuaded. Sharing the truth of the gospel should be a joy and a privilege, not a burden. We, be, we should be prepared to share our testimony, who we were before we got saved, how we came to know Christ, who we are in Him. And we're going to see that people respond to... By the way, people's response to the gospel is not up to us. Amen? But it is up to us to make sure, that, sure they have a gospel to respond to. Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank You, we praise You, we love You, Lord. You are indeed a great and an awesome God. I pray if there's anybody here this morning that doesn't know you, that today would be the day of salvation. If you're here this morning, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. You've never made the conscious choice to respond to the call of the Holy Spirit who's drawing you into salvation, to turn and surrender your life fully to Jesus Christ. My prayer is that nobody leaves here almost persuaded. That you would make a conscious choice today to surrender your life fully to Jesus Christ. It says in Romans, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. Amen? If you deny me for it, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, that's in Romans. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. If you've never confessed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, if you've never made him the Lord of your life, I'm going to ask you to do something right now to confess him openly. Confess him before men, that he might confess you before his Father in heaven. If you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, it's your desire to surrender your life to him, to go beyond being almost persuaded to a life fully surrendered. If that's your desire, I just want you to raise your hand right where you are so I can pray with you. Anybody at all? God bless you. Anybody else? Today's the day of salvation. Amen. Anybody else? Don't leave here without him. Amen? Amen. Don't be almost persuaded.
those that raise their hands, just pray this with me. You can pray it silently or out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning and I confess that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus Christ is God. That he died on the cross. That he rose from the dead. I confess my sin. Please, Lord, forgive me. I believe upon my confession that you're making me a new creation in Christ. You're going to fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me, for adopting me into your family. Lord, help me to walk with you. I look forward to the day when I will see you face to face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All God's people said. Amen. Bible says, when one person is saved, all the angels in heaven rejoice. So there's a party in heaven. Let's have one in here. Amen. Let's work it.